Hello. So I've been absent for a few days, just had some things to take care of at home and busy and so on. But I've had a couple of things happen which are quite interesting, I think. First of all, I think pretty much everyone that's bought the Believe book has written to me or got in contact or something and it seems to have had a pretty powerful effect on, on people. Um, at least a couple of them are essentially converting to Catholicism, real Catholicism, as a result of reading it in great part, which is quite astonishing to me. I didn't expect it to have that level of impact on people, to be honest, because I thought, you know, most people just don't really change. But um, so, yeah, I'm pleased about that. Um, it seems to be sort of answering quite a lot of questions and also directing people to other sources of information if they want to go deeper. So that's uh, a pleasant surprise. And then I've also had a couple of bears. Um, I won't mention who they are just because I don't know if they want to be associated or not. But um, um, one uh, lady bear who very, very kindly pointed me to um, the magazines of an organization called Chiesa Viva, which is Italian for living church. And um, they published a number of, of uh, books and so on. But astonishing. Most of it's in Italian, so it probably won't mean much to you. But there was a lot of really in-depth information, most of which I already knew. But this names names and, and sort of tells people things. So I will be using some of that information in the upcoming documentary, which I'm making. And one of the other bears, pretty well-known one, well, they're both pretty well-known bears, um, also uh, extended to me an offer of help, which was very, very welcome. So um, I, I gotta be honest, I don't really know these people. I don't really know the bear. I, I sort of know the bears a little bit from, you know, commenting now and then on, on Owen's live stream when I catch one. But it seems to be a really, a community of really great people and, um, you know, offering help and, and sort of sort of being on your side pretty much from the get go. So I'm very impressed with that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it makes sense because, you know, I think Owen is a, is an honest person. Um, I think I, I've missed quite a few live streams of Owens and, and even just catching up with them is, is difficult because they're quite long and, you know, my time is pretty limited. Similarly with Vox Day stuff, I'm always a few days behind, but I believe, um, there's been a, um, a revelation, if you like, about uh, Nick Fuentes. And I saw Owen have a bit of a go um, at him, uh, probably, you know, rightly so. I, I don't know. I, I don't know the whole, all the details of it, but I believe that uh, what happened is that Nick was disrespectful to some of the bears in some way. And um, Owen took exception to that, which I understand. That's very uh, understandable, very normal. Um, and apparently this Nick Fuentes guy uh, considers himself a Catholic. Um, I don't know the whole detail. I've never watched a single stream of Nick Fuentes. I don't really know who he is other than he's a young kid who represents himself as Catholic apparently. But from the piece of the, um, of the stream that Owen did, which I caught on unauthorized, um, and I only caught a piece of it. So again, um, I might be speaking out of turn, but it appears that this Nick Fuentes guy, just from from what Owen was saying, it seems to me that this Nick Fuentes guy is a Novus Orco churchian, uh, not a Catholic. Uh, as as those of you that watch my channel and have looked at the church stuff on, you know, it's video number one and two, so, and then video number 26 and so on and, and others. And I mention it quite frequently. You know, just because you call yourself a churchian doesn't, you know, just, sorry, just because you call yourself a Catholic doesn't mean that you are one. You know, most, most so-called Catholics are churchians. Um, so, you know, it, it is what it is. I mean, I, I can call myself um, a Nigerian basketball player. Doesn't make me one, you know. Um, and I can pretend to be a Nigerian basketball player. I don't know, maybe I can fool some people into believing that I'm a Nigerian basketball player. Certainly in today's world, that seems to be uh, much more likely. But I'm not, you know, I, unbelievable as it may sound, you know, 
and um, you you might be able to tell from the fact that my teeth are not pearly whites perfectly you know there you go they're just not Nigerian teeth you know if, if you've ever been to Nigeria and I lived there for a few years you'll know that that feature is probably what would set me apart from real Nigerian basketball players you know everything else pretty much the same but you know the teeth that gives it away so anyway um, what I really wanted to discuss today was the concept of truth and paradox and Catholic thinking and they're all very interrelated but I don't want it to be just about Catholicism I want it to be a more general sort of uh, how to spot the, the falsity the lies and so on now a very important thing and Unfortunately, or fortunately, or whatever, it is related to Catholicism. Absolutely, it is. The problem with a lot of Protestant uh, countries, Protestant zeitgeist, you know, zeitgeist is a German word that I believe means something along the lines of worldview. The Protestant area of thinking tends to be rather puritanical, which in turn tends to be binary. That is black and white, right and wrong, good and bad. Now, you can do a lot with binary thinking, but it is limited. And truth, absolute truth and deeper truth and God truth is often not binary. Now, that does not mean it's not clear. It doesn't mean it doesn't have a very, very clear line. But it's almost like the difference between two-dimensional thinking, you know, or, or living as a two-dimensional person or living as a three-dimensional person. You know, I've, I've made the sketch and I've referred to it before you know whatever the timeline but right now I'm just talking about that little circle if you're a two-dimensional person and you you're a dot inside that circle you can only move along the surface you're gonna bump into these walls and that's it you know that will be your worldview it'll be very limited if you're a three-dimensional person you'll realize this is just a circle in two dimensions and you can hop over that line it doesn't mean that you're any less aware of this circle it just means that you have a better perspective on it. So another way to represent paradoxical thinking, which is very much a Catholic thing, you, you, you cannot really be a Catholic um, if you're a binary thinker. You'd be a churchian, you'd be a stunted Catholic, you'd be somewhat of a crippled Catholic. Catholicism embodies uh, paradox, three-dimensional thinking, what I call three-dimensional thinking, and... Um, um, you know, if you read Thomas Aquinas, if you read the Fathers of the Church, St. Augustine, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Pick any one of them. There's, there's plenty of saints that have written a lot of stuff. You can see a, a finesse of mind, a finesse of logic that is quite beautiful to behold. And I'd like to give you a very simple example. Imagine two spaceship captains traveling, both of them, close to the speed of light in their, you know, super special spaceship. Now, and Im sorry, imagine three spaceship captains, you know. One of the spaceship captains says that a particular star in the sky is blue. Another one of the spaceship captains says that that's a lie and the star is red. And another one of the spaceship captains says the other two are both lying and the star is yellow. Now, who's correct? What's the truth? If you're a Protestant thinker, you're going to be either the blue captain or the red captain or the yellow captain. And you're going to say, that's it. This is the truth and the rest are all liars. Can you already see there are three different opinions and you can't tell which one is which? If you're a Catholic, you're going to ask a few questions. You're going to say, captain that says it's yellow. What is your position in relation to the star? I'm orbiting it. Okay. You're orbiting it. Yeah. At what speed? Oh, 50,000 kilometers an hour. All right. Blue captain, what is your position in relation to the star? It's right in front of me. I'm flying towards it at 98% light speed. Oh, red captain, what is your position? Red captain says, I'm flying directly away from the star. It's directly behind me. I'm flying away from it at 98% of light speed. Now, I might be a little bit off on the numbers. But the fact is, all three of those people are telling the truth. None of them are seeing the full picture. The full picture being that if you're approaching a star at light speed, the light waves are going to be appear compressed to you. So there'll be shorter waves. And shorter waves mean bluer 
light. If you're going away from it, the light waves are trying to catch up to you, and as one light wave hits you, you're still moving, so the next one has to take longer to catch you, and it's going to appear redshifted. So the captain that's in orbit will see the star in its natural color without any relativity movement. He'll see it as yellow. I know, I know, you're going to say that, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity is bullshit, blah, 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 and all that. However, some of these things have been observed. So regardless of Einstein, his theory of relativity, and so on, this analogy works for what I'm trying to explain to you. And you can also see that if you're a Catholic, you will have one answer that answers all three positions. One truth that answers all three positions. And you will have a rule that explains every one of those three positions. If you're a Protestant, you're going to be in error. You will be telling the truth as far as you can see, but you will be in error for two thirds. Because whether you say it's blue, red or yellow, you're ignoring the other two thirds of reality around you. And this is very much the difference between Catholic thinking and Protestant thinking. You cannot think correctly if you're a binary thinker. You will make far larger and more frequent mistakes than a three-dimensional thinker. Now, the only problem is that in today's world, most people do not know how to think properly. They have no concept of what a logical syllogism is. They have no concept of the idea of arguing. They don't even know what an argument is. They think an argument is when two people are shouting at each other. That's not an argument. An argument is when somebody presents their axioms, and maybe a lot of people watching this don't know what an axiom is, then presents their um, their um, premises. So you've got axioms, you've got premises, and then you've got your hypotheses. And the other guy on the other side says, right, those are your axioms, those are your premises, these are your hypotheses, and checks your work. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, however, I have a reservation about one of your axioms and three of your premises, and they are this. So then they discuss it, and they agree, okay, let's Let's keep the axioms the same, but now we change the premises to what you're saying. And let's see who comes closer to what we observe in reality. And that's how you progress. And that's how science essentially became invented. And who did that? Catholic monks, for the most part. It was the church that invented science, not the other way around. And now science has left the church and it is, of course, degrading and falling into absolute corruption. It is now a simple fact that more than 50% of peer reviewed papers state facts that are not reproducible. In other words, so called more than 50% of so called peer reviewed science cannot be repeated with the same results by anybody. In other words, it's bullshit. It's bad design, it's bad recording, it's bad conclusion, it's bad premises, it's bad thesis, and that's when it's not outright fraudulent, like climate change, for example. You know, the, the climate change is such fucking nonsense, it's ridiculous. I mean, these people have got caught worldwide perpetrating a fraud. There are emails that absolutely state it's a fraud. And it all started with a complete fraud, a liar, somebody who presents himself as having been... I think either won or being awarded or, or, or being on the, on the short list or something for a Nobel Prize. And Michael Mann, I believe is his name. Absolute fraud, complete liar. He's the guy who invented the hockey stick bullshit. Nonsense, absolute nonsense. Do you want to know something about climate change? Here's the thing. The sun has got four magnetic, um, layman's terms, right? Because I, I, um, I re looked into this a while back and um, I'm not 100% sure of the terms, whatever. But anyway, the Earth has got a magnetosphere. The Sun has got essentially four magnetic fields, if you like, that are in a certain, they're in certain phases. When we had the last ice age, which was a pretty, you know, grim, cold event for the whole planet, two of these phases were out of sequence. They were out of whack. Guess what's happening in 2020? In 2020, all four of these phases are going to go out of whack. So, you think we're going to have global warming? Really? Here's another interesting tidbit. The ice shelves on Antarctica and the Arctic have both increased over the last 10 years. 
by a lot. Here's another interesting tidbit. There is a Russian scientist, group of scientists, and uh, I think led by one original um, creator of the model, which took sunspots and sun activity into account in their model. They have been predicting the weather for over 30 years with this model, all right? Now, do you know what the Western uh, percentage of accuracy of uh, uh, weather prediction is over two years, three years? It's fuck all. It's, it's, they don't know. This Russian model has been predicting the weather and so-called climate change to 98% efficiency over a period of over 30 years now. So, you think you're going to have global warming? And here's an additional, slightly worrying piece of information. The magnetic North Pole has been drifting for the last 900 years. And most of that drift has happened in the last 100 years. And most of that drift has happened in the last 40 years. And most of that drift has happened in the last 20 years. You see a pattern? It's a curve and it's sort of speeding up. You know what else? The Earth has switched magnetic poles many times. Now, when the Earth switches magnetic poles, no one really knows what happens. But here's a thing, which, by the way, you can find in my book, The Face on Mars, of which I've got a few copies now. I, I ordered a few copies. There you go. All the, all the stuff pretty much is in here, apart from the, the uh, weather prediction for 30 years, because I, I didn't know that at the time. But the North Pole switching places with the South Pole is in here. And guess what some of the things that might happen are when you get such a sudden shift and it appears like it is going to be sudden. You have massive tectonic upheavals and they have found in Siberia completely frozen mammoths with fresh little flowers in their mouth that they were eating. Now, in order for a little flower to remain fresh for a couple of, you know, a few thousand years, when the last time mammoths walked the earth, it means that this mammoth was pretty much freeze dried, if not instantly within a period of minutes, you know, probably not even hours, not even an hour, so quickly and perfectly preserved. So totally frozen mammoth with little flowers in its mouth. Really? How the hell did that happen? Well, pole shift. Pole shift is one possibility. There was a film that was made about this um, sort of thing called, I think, The Day After Tomorrow, something like that, where the pole shift happens and they show you this dramatic thing where like North America becomes all um, englobed by ice and now you've got American refugees going to Mexico and Mexico is, is taking them in like, the good people that Mexicans are, <laughs> you know, a little bit of political sort of ramming down your throat stuff there. But um, anyway, the point is, it was obviously a dramatized Hollywood version of stuff, but it's a possibility, you know. If that sort of thing is going to happen, it also ties in with the predictions about Revelation and the fact that possibly the next time around, you know, God... Um, um, Apparently, you know, with the rainbow said he's not going to drown us out anymore. But if you have enough tectonic shifts, you're going to have volcanoes going off everywhere. You will have tsunamis that will wipe out a lot of people. And no one really knows because it's been kept secret and hidden and covered up. But apparently the third secret of Fatima is that there will be millions of people wiped out by huge tidal waves. Kind of sucks because I want to live near the ocean. So either I've got to get real good at surfing um, or, you know, with kids and stuff, or, um, I don't know, may maybe I'll be one of the wiped up if that happens, but no point worrying about it. What I mean is, anyway, the reason I brought that up was because you can find the truth. It, 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 there is information that will lead you closer to the truth, but you need to learn to, to think correctly, which means being able to do logic, which means being able to understand what ratios are. Set theory, you know, the mathematical concept of set theory is important. Ratios are important. Percentages are important. All of these things are important because they are different ways to begin to understand statistics. You know, binomial equations are complicated things. And understanding those is pretty rare for most people. But you can still have a decent grasp of things if you begin to understand these, these concepts. And if you begin to study 
they often misconstrued ideas that people had because of perceived statistics rather than actual results of statistics. For example, if you throw a six-sided dice a hundred times, you know, and let's say the last three rolls, you, you roll the six each time, the fourth roll, you think, oh, it's very, very unlikely that I'm going to roll a six again. The reality is that if the six-sided dice is not, you know, loaded or whatever, your chances are of rolling a six are exactly the same as all the other times. So now there is a further complication onto that, which is the statistics of rolling a six each time are the same. However, rolling a chain of sixes is a further iteration of the, the issue. And there will be statistics for that. Again, this leads one into the concepts of Catholic theology, because, you know, if you just look at the micro uh, event, you will say, oh, well, I'll roll a six sided dice and it can come up any one of the six numbers with equal, um, with equal chances. And that's true. And yet, if you've rolled a dice a thousand times, you will find out that, generally speaking, you're very unlikely to get the same number more than three, four, maximum maybe five times in a row because you're now adding a further dimension to the issue. So if you don't know anything else and you're all a six-sided dice, you're going to say, oh, well, uh, the chances of it being a six are the same as all the other ones. But if you've rolled that dice 10,000 times, or even 20,000 times, and you now know that you're on a streak, and, and the dice is not loaded, right? It's, it's a fair dice. You're on a streak where you've rolled six, seven times in a row, right? You've rolled this dice 20,000 times, you've now rolled the number six, seven times in a row. This is your eighth roll. Are you gonna bet that it comes up six again? That'd be foolish, because the likelihood of it being six is less given the fact that you have information pertaining to what happened before. Again, this is going deeper into the issue, having more information, just like the three captains, you know, on the star and so on. So theological thinking is, is important in that context. And I bring this up because I had a, quite an interesting conversation with one of the guys that did read the book, I believe, or believe rather, um, it's recently come out. I need to redo the cover because it's a little bit um, off center, which upsets me. Um, so I will, you know, clean that up. But if, if you want to get one of the flawed copies, uh, you order it soon because I'll change it in the next day or so, a couple of days, hopefully within a week. And um, anyway, the point is that what I discussed with this man was. <clears throat> You know, he's, he's had a Protestant upbringing. I don't want to say too much about his personal life because, again, I, I don't think it's fair. But let's just say that his family had run-ins with supposedly Catholic people and uh, they had very bad experiences. And, of course, these men certainly did not behave like any kind of a Catholic. And I very much doubt they, they were genuine Catholic. I believe they were Novus Orkins. And Novus Orkins are not Catholics. They are at best apostates or uh, heretics through ignorance, uh, laziness, and uh, general uh, human flaws. But uh, more likely, from, from what I've, I've, I know about the situation, they were uh, complete apostates and not even Christian of any kind, never mind Catholic. So, <clears throat> and yet, what impressed me was that this man has obviously been searching for the truth for quite a while. And he's definitely had a very staunch uh, Protestant generic upbringing and belief. You know, his, his belief is pretty blinkered in a way, but a good guy. And, you know, and he's, he's just like all of us. He has achieved some level of understanding of the truth. Um, for example, he realized early on that contraception was evil and wrong and and uh, counter to God's plans for us which being a Protestant is quite unusual you know 
um, and in our conversation, he actually took on information, which I, which was impressive because, in my experience, honestly, most people cannot do dialectic. They cannot learn from facts, from absolutely undeniable facts. They can't learn. In fact, they can't even take in the fact. They can't even take in the facts and verify it for themselves or check on it or read up on it. They can't. They're just so blocked. They, they can't even listen. Their automatic response is an immediate no, but, no, but, no, but, or what about this, or what about that? Either diverge, deflect, or counter. No arguing. No listening to that position, considering it on its merits. And then if you try and dismiss it, consider it on its merits. Do not disregard its premises. Do not disregard its axioms. If you're doing that, you're intellectually dishonest. And you're not looking for the truth. You're now just trying to satisfy your ego or, or, or keep your prejudices or remain dumb, you know, essentially. So it was quite impressive that um, he took on a lot of information to the point where, you know, he's considering um, Catholicism, which given his personal history, I, I find astonishing. I find uh, commendable. To be honest, you know, I, well, funnily enough, I had a conversation about that with my wife earlier about Catholicism, and Catholic thinking and so on. And she asked me, oh, would have you been happier to have been baptized and brought up as a Catholic? To which I said, well, depends what you mean. Because if anything, I was brought up a little bit anti-Catholic rather than, than anything else. Because my parents weren't really catechized. They didn't baptize me. And they pointed out the hypocrisy, lies, and, and just general conmanship of the so-called Catholic Church. They were uncatechized, ignorant of the fact that what they were looking at wasn't the Catholic Church, it was the Novus Orco Church. But they didn't know that, you know, I mean, my father was born in 47. So what the hell did he know about Vatican II and the fact that the popes took over in 58? You know, sure, he, he was, I mean, he was like, what, he was 16 when Vatican II started? What the hell does a 16-year-old who's, in, you know, crazy about girls and fighting and whatever, you know, he <laughs> just isn't going to know any of that stuff. The fault of things like Vatican II and so on, at the generation before his, you know, it, it would be my grandparents, if, if anything that should have seen this and stopped it and, and fixed it. Um, and they didn't, they let it happen. Um, they let it happen because they had a couple of world wars behind them, bashed the crap out of them. And they're, they're you know, they were traumatized by two world wars. Who the hell wouldn't be? And they're like, geez, I just want my kids to be happy and not go through the evil shit that I had to see. It's understandable, it's human. Unfortunately, it allowed the door to open to the infiltration of the church and the almost total collapse of what was the Catholic Church. So if I'd been raised by my parents Catholic, I would have been raised as a Novus Orkian, which made a complete nonsense of truth, reality, beauty, justice, you know, and God. So in, an, in, in a sense, I'm glad I was brought up to see the flaws, the lies and the viciousness of the, of the fake church. And I always thought of it as that. Of course, I didn't know that there ever was a real church. I thought that was all there was and always had been. It was only much later in life when I had this road to Damascus moment that I started to investigate it myself, that I discovered the truth. And it was like, oh, and, you know, I had absolutely no dog in the fight. I mean, if I looked into it and decided that the truth was with that fat German Martin Luther King, I would have said it. I would have said, you know, that's what's. The most reasonable makes the most sense. It's, you know, of course, that's nonsense. It isn't. You you can argue really only for three types of Christianity. You know, if if Christianity is true, if Christianity is real, you can only essentially truly be either Catholic, Orthodox, or a Copt. It's got to be one of those three because they were there from the beginning. So, you can't. Um, you can't really come up with Protestantism or, or whatever, you know, other nonsense or the Novus Orco guys, you know, it's, it's, it's nonsense. 
It's got to be one of those three. You could argue about which one of those three. You know, reasonably, you could argue that. And I, as far as I looked into it, um, Copt was just too far away, too strange, too unknown. They almost don't exist anymore. And I think they're probably quite likely to be completely wiped out pretty soon because they're getting slaughtered, you know, out there in the Middle East. But those guys, you know, that believe those, those the few cops that I've met have been hardcore Christian believers, you know, so you, you could definitely argue their side. I've met quite a lot of Orthodox, um, both Greek and Russian, and they're very solid people, you know, they're, they tend to be quite solid human beings. Um, and then I looked at Catholicism and of course, when I thought that Catholicism was the Novus Orco Church, it was just a barn to me. Um, but I looked into the origins of it, and I'm like, well, how, you know, what happened? How did it become like that? And oh, lo and behold, guess what? You know, that's not Catholic Church at all. So, and then you make your choice. You know, whatever fits your way of thinking and seeing things best. But um, you know, that's essentially it. So I wanted to bring up the concept of paradoxical thinking it's important you know a paradox is something that appears to be uh, two or more opposing uh, concepts but in reality is just one truth once you have all the information regarding it um, or more of information regarding it you know and keep in mind we're all in error to some degree or other but the point is try and minimize your error you know so um, yeah it's um, and also learn about the Catholic Church because I guarantee you that pretty much everything you believe about the Catholic Church, unless you're already someone like myself that has really looked into it and, and discovered the whole Vatican II fraud and all that, unless you're one of those people, which are very few and far between, almost everything you believe about the Catholic Church is a lie. It's an absolute lie. You know, Mariology, uh, worshiping the saints, all bullshit. It's all bullshit, all right? You don't actually know what the Catholic Church is. And again, you know, you could look at it just in a macro concept. Who stopped the, um, the Saracens, the Muslims, from taking over Europe? Who did that? That was Catholics. You know, who translated the Bible and so on and, and had it available for people? The Catholics. Now you've been taught by the Protestants that the Catholics don't let people read the Bible. It's nonsense. It's not true. Um, but there is a concept in, in Catholic dogma and Catholic thought, which is very, very, very good, very real, very true. And it's simply this. You take the average person, let them read an article in a newspaper, and then tell them to write you an essay in their own words, without referring back to what they read, telling you what that article was about. Do that as an exercise in school if you're a teacher. See what crap you get back. Ever heard of the concept of Chinese telephone? Where one person whispers one sentence into the ear of one person, and that person does it to another person, and so on. By the time you get to the end of 20 people, the final sentence has got absolutely nothing to do with the initial sentence, right? The average person cannot read a paragraph in a newspaper and write it in his own words in a way that makes sense, okay? But you expect these people to read works that are like over 2,000 years old in languages that are not their languages, in context that they don't understand, in a couple of different languages, and understand the context, the meaning, the truth of it all. And then they're all going to get it the same? No. That's why Protestants in, you know, the, the, the alternative name of Protestantism is Legion. Everyone's got their own idea and everyone's the king. No, no. For most people, honestly, for most people, to go to a church where there is a good, decent, true, honest Catholic priest doing his best. Remember, he's a human being, he's flawed too. But a Catholic priest doing his best to tell the truth of the Gospels and they just follow what the priest tells them, that's fine. That's pretty much as good as it gets. That's how Western civilization was created, okay? All of Western civilization was pretty much, very vast majority of it, created by that. 
Okay, now it's true that priests can be corrupt and so on and so forth. You know, absolutely true. I mean, just read the history of the popes. It's brilliant. You know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm reading it again. And uh, it's called The Popes by Julius Norwich. I, I forgot his name now. Brilliant book. You know, um, it, it's got a couple of little flaws, but they're, in the main, it's, it's a brilliant piece of historical fact. And one thing that jumps out at me is the supernatural protection that the church has obviously enjoyed because some of these popes were absolute, you know, some of these guys did have gay orgies. Some of these guys had heterosexual orgies in, in the Vatican. You know, they, they, they sold offices, they made their own nephews cardinals and so on and so forth. But some very interesting things came out. Despite all this absolute greed, rush for power, there were occasionally good popes. You know, there were occasionally true believers as popes. But by and large, it was it was uh, pretty much a bunch of power-hungry politicians to a certain degree or other. But one very important point, almost none of them tried to go against Catholic dogma. They would steal, rob, and and bang whatever moved but they left catholic dogma pretty much alone um, unlike our present uh, fake pope uh, bergoglio and his predecessors on which i will have a lot more to say in the documentary that i'm, I'm making with proof absolute proof that these people are not just apostates but they are anti anti-christian you know they're satanistic scum um, and their origins have always been satanistic scum um, and I, I will demonstrate that. But anyway, the fact is, you've got to sort of wonder, how could the church even exist if it wasn't due to supernatural protection? And the fact that the Catholic truths have been promulgated by people that were on a human level pretty, you know, disgusting. Most, you know, a lot of them, let's say, maybe not even most of them, but a lot of them were, were definitely completely flawed you know, human being. I mean, of all the ones that I've read, the one Pope that I remember the most is Clementine, I think the first, if I remember right, because he was a hermit. And basically they voted this guy to become Pope because there had been such, in, you know, massive fraud, assassinations, political intrigue, you know, a Byzantine sort of real mess that they said, look, guys, we've all gone just too far. Let's just actually pick an innocent guy so that we like... And they made this guy Pope and he didn't want to be Pope. So he kept running back off into the mountains, into his cave or whatever. And they had to go and get him back from the mountains a couple of times. And eventually he abdicated. He said, you just want to be left alone. And he went off into a monastery to be left alone. I think that guy was probably the best Pope to a certain extent, you know. So, and yet the church prevailed and the gospel prevailed and the truth prevailed despite these horrific people which is quite a different set of circumstances if you consider that, you know, divorce, abortion, um, even contraception are still, even in the Novus Orca Church, which has basically had the run of, of the place for 60 years now, uh, no, 70 years, they've, they've essentially been running things for 70 years and they're still struggling to get rid of concepts like contraception that divorce is not allowed. They're, they're, they're doing it, they're, they're doing it, and they will succeed in, in you know, overturning it because they are a Novus Orc of fake church. But it's taken them 70 years and they're still not quite there. You know, Officially, the position of the church is still no contraception, no divorce, and so on. That's from the day one, from get-go. You know, that's, uh, that's a good run. That's a good run. And anyway, we're told that in the end, the church will fail and will be infiltrated and will become the seat of Satan. We're told that. So all to be expected, you know, don't get disheartened. If you're, if you're a Christian, you know, there's, that's another thing that came across to me. A lot of these uh, ex-Protestants, because some have become Catholic uh, people that have been talking to me. And, you know, some of these people, they're, they're taking, it's, it's serious stuff because they're surrounded by Protestants, their families are Protestant, and they're secret Catholics, you know, in their own family, and they don't know how to broach the subject with their loved ones. It's difficult, absolutely. But these people are truth seekers, and 
you know, they talk to me. I have conversations with several of them. I try and help them as best I can. You know, I don't want to destroy their families or anything like that. But the truth is the truth. And um, they, it's not the only time that's happened in history. It won't be the last time. You know, Catholics have had to be secret Catholics many places. You know, even in Japan, it turns out, you know, the Catholics were persecuted there and killed and so on. But quite a lot of samurai, apparently, this was only found out you know, a few hundred years later and, and uh, was recently reported a couple of years ago, I think, that on the um, inside, the, um, uh, what do you call that, the, the, the circular piece to block the blade of the samurai swords, on the inside of that, you know, the, there were inscribed crosses and little phrases in Latin and so on. So there were secret Christian samurai. It's a very interesting concept, you know. Um, keep in mind the penalty was death for that sort of thing. So again, you've got people that know the truth and will die for the truth. You know, the samurai were not afraid of death. Um, and yet they hid the fact of being Christians, Catholics, because, you know, essentially you've got two roots as a, as a, as a Catholic. And this sounds binary. This is going to sound binary. But the fact is that the truth is either true or it's not. Okay? So, if you're Catholic, you essentially have only got two routes. Martyrdom or warrior. You know, you don't have another option. The church on earth, the living church, is called the church militant. It's the church militant. Why? Because we're an army of soldiers behind enemy lines, because we live under the domain of Satan. And your options are two. Either you're a martyr or you're a warrior. Now, naturally, intrinsically, as a human being, um, you're flawed and you're broken. So you can end up being a bad warrior. You can end up being a bad martyr. You can being, end up being a fake martyr. You can end up being a cowardly warrior. You know, But intrinsically, in your soul, you really only have those two options. Now, I know which I am. I'm not willing to be martyred. You know, there's a very, very small set of circumstances under which I, I, I would choose to be martyred rather than going out fighting and taking out as many of the enemy as I can. And some people will say, that's bad, you know, you shouldn't be a warrior. Uh, listen, you know, fuck you. Because it was the Knights of Malta that stopped 20,000 Muslims from coming into Europe. You know, it was Catholic knights, it was Catholic men armed to the teeth that fought to the last man, that fought beyond human endurance of any kind, that stopped the Muslim invasions. You think that Christendom would exist without people like that? No. Now, I agree that a martyr, a real martyr, somebody who's willing to sacrifice themselves completely for the truth, God, love, that guy's above me, you know? That's the other thing. Christendom and the Christian, you know, the hierarchy of heaven has got a hierarchy. You've got archangels, you've got angels, you've got cherubims, there's different ranks, all right? I know where my rank is, I'm somewhere near the bottom, you know, that's, you know, remember, even I think it's in the Old Testament, or, I, you know, I, I don't read a lot of the Old Testament because I understand that you really kind of need to be a bit of an expert to understand when parts of the Old Testament are allegory and how they're told and the fact that they're parables in many cases. So it's, it's a difficult sort of book on one level. On another level, it's relatively simple if you don't try and read too much into it. You know, if you do start to read a bit too much into it, then you have to be a really, really good expert at the stuff to not get completely lost, confused and go down the wrong road. And I'm no expert. So, you know, I leave that to whatever the people who were interested in that stuff. But the reality is there's a hierarchy of, of, of beings of where you fall into the scheme of things. And of course, Martins are, are way up. They're way above me, you know, people like me. And people like me can very often be wrong. They can be in error because their nature, their soul, their, their instinct is to be a fighter, to be a warrior, to be a soldier, to be a whatever. And those guys can be wrong. You know, they can be attacking the wrong thing. They can believe in the wrong thing. And they're like a little wind-up toy. You know, once you wind him up, you point him in a direction and that's where he goes. And if that's the wrong direction, you know, it's a problem. A big problem. 
but uh, they're dangerous things, you know, warrior, warrior spirit people. They're dangerous creatures. But if you aim them right, they'll save civilization, you know. Everyone has their use, everyone has their niche, everyone has their thing. So I absolutely uh, think it makes an absolute difference, you know. You, you need people like that. It's not for everybody. But if and when the shit hits the fan, you know, there is such a thing as just war. Just war is, again, Catholic concept. Just war. You can wage war on others, on people, justly, correctly, within God's laws. And you can even strike preemptively. It's absolutely allowed. But again, you need to have justice. You need to understand what the truth is. You need to understand what love is. You need to understand what protection is. You need to understand, you know, not mafia protection, right? That's me in the old days. You need to understand <laughs> protection of the innocent, that sort of thing. Protection of yourself, of your family, of your loved ones, that sort of stuff. So, you know, that's what I mean. Think about this stuff a little bit, if you like. It's, it's interesting. Try and um, think about these things. You know, if you are a Protestant, think about it. Why? Look at number 26. You know, if you are absolutely at peace in your Protestantism, there's no reason that you can't watch my arguments or read them and say, you know, yeah, this is the flaw, this is the wrong thinking, that's what's wrong. The fact is, anyone that's tried can't. You know, I, I, I've been in groups where <laughs> there's like the, uh, the people who can't be convinced by facts, you know, they, they, they team up and they try and like, throw slings and arrows and it's like it's just spitballs at a battleship she's like oh you, you again well ding, and i just push a button and whew, you know nuclear missile takes them out again because there are certain unalienable truths that are like oh well but your law is your only law is whatever you want is your law you know you, you, you're satanic well how can you say well you're a protestant satanic but 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 no no but i i i read the bible i believe the bible no you don't no you don't you interpret the Bible. It's interpret as I will. Oh, that's the whole of the law. Protestant law. Interpret as I will. It's the whole of the law. That's why you got 50,000 branches. And growing. And you can create one yourself tomorrow. Yeah. That's what it is. It's the law of Satan. Do as you will shall be the whole of the law. Alistair Crowley. That is Satan's law. All, the only law is do whatever you want. How's that different from interpret however you like? And every Protestant watching this now, if they got this far, is saying, no, I don't interpret as though I interpret as the Bible. Then explain to me why there's 50,000 denominations. Yeah? And explain to me why the Catholic Church had Latin Mass all over the world. Exactly identical. All over the world. Until 1958 and then 1962 and 63 when the Novus Oracles came in. Which, by the way, you know who wrote a lot of the Vatican II documents? Protestants. I will get into the details of that later on. But yeah, Novus Orchism is another branch of Protestantism infiltration. You've got to answer these questions. As a Protestant, you do not know church history. You do not read it. You're prevented from reading it. You're lied about it. They lied to you about it. Okay, and the honest Protestants that have communicated with me, that email me, that message me, that text me, those guys, every single one of them is telling me, I didn't know that. Oh my God, I didn't know that. Oh, I, I, I was lied to. I never knew that. Again and again and again and again and again. So, look, I don't make my living off my books, all right? I really don't. But if you're interested in this stuff, Buy that book. Buy Believe. Read it. And read the books that I mentioned in it. You know, because I don't, I don't just, it's not just me. I'm saying, look, if you want information on why there's so many Catholic lies about the Catholics, here, here's a book that shows you those facts. If you want to understand, you know, a little bit better, like maybe how God's mind works, read The Irrational Atheist, which I think, there we go. You know, my, my friend, my friend Box Day wrote this. This really good book. It's a really good book. I think, 
<laughs> it's a, a nice dedication that he, that he gave me here. You know, live free or else. It's it's beautiful, you know. And you know, uh, Vox is not a Catholic. Vox is not a Catholic, but he's got some good stuff in here. Real, real interesting, intelli intelligent, you know, true things. So the truth matters. The truth matters, guys. And in the end, like I said, you know, Vox, Owen, these kind of people, they're kind of outliers. But chances are most of the people watching these videos are not, you know. I think a higher percentage than normal are probably outliers that watch my videos um, just because of the nature of the way I speak and so on. But most of us are just normal human beings, you know, and even even outliers like me or whatever. There's plenty of stuff that I'm completely ignorant about. I mean, you know, if I was going to have anything about opera told to me, I went to opera once. And I could recognize, without knowing a damn thing about music or anything, that the guy conducting was world class. I could just tell that from martial arts, weirdly enough. Nothing to do with music. But I could tell. I said, well, I don't know what that guy is, but he, he must be in the top world, you know. And I found out later he's number three in the world as a conductor. A Russian guy. Forgot his name. But I don't know anything about opera. Okay. I, Oh, I don't know. You, there's, there's a million things I don't know anything about. And I'd just shut up and listen if somebody told me about it, you know. Or if, if somebody said to me, you know what? You're completely wrong about Catholicism. I can prove it to you. Here's five bucks book. Shoot it down if you can. I'd probably buy that book. You know, if especially if I'd seen some videos about this guy and, and he's got some salient points. There's going to be a thousand people that say, you're completely wrong about Catholicism, buy my book. And they're complete fucking retards. You know, they can't put string two sentences together or a syllogism in their mind or, or put it on paper. I, I, you know, I'm not interested in those fucking idiots or those gamma people. But, you know, a three-year-old kid could point out an error to me that I've made. I'll own up to it right there. No problem, you know. So... If you can do dialectic, and you should try and learn to do dialectic, you know, if you can't, if you're not sure, if you don't know how, if you're a woman, if you're a woman, you're very unlikely to be able to do good dialectic other than when you're calm. And if your emotions get stirred up, then it's going to be harder for you. It's hard. Okay. As a woman, it's a lot harder for you to do dialectic thinking than for a man. It's just harder. It's a biological thing. It's not your fault, but we can all improve. We can all learn. We can all become better than what we are, all of us. Improvement doesn't stop, okay? You either get better or you stagnate. And if you stagnate, guess what happens? You get worse, okay? You either keep improving or you sink. And eventually, as you get older, even if you keep trying, you're still going to degrade, okay? But you're going to degrade a lot less if you keep moving, if you keep doing stuff, if you keep learning, if you keep using your brain, if you keep using your body. It's going to be a hell of a lot better, uh, easier, healthier life all the way to the end. You know, my grandfather died at 92 in his sleep, but until he was 85 and until he fell and broke his hip a few years later, that guy used to go hunting in the hills by himself with his shotgun, carrying a shotgun, going over the fences, 85 years old. I was 16. I went hunting with him. I was like, shit, you know, old man walked all this stuff and... You know, I wasn't tired, but I felt that we'd had a good walk. And I was 16, and I was swimming every day. I was, like, fucking fitter than I've probably ever been in my life. I think my heart got enlarged from swimming so much I was swimming. And I, I felt it. You know, we had a good, decent walk. He was 85. And he carried the, sh the shotgun because, you know, a little bit paranoid in my family. Like, no, oh, you're just a young boy. When we crossed the, <laughs> when we crossed the, the fence... He unloaded the shotgun, gave me the empty shotgun to hold while he went over. I was, you know, I smiled because I went hunt. I lived in Africa with my dad. I went hunting with my, I mean, one day with my dad once, we shot over 300 shotgun shells between the two of us because um, it was like uh, near a little pond. You know, there was a pond and there was um, quite tall trees and stuff. And these, um, uh, what do you call them? I suppose they're kind of a wild pigeon. I don't know what the name is in English. It's it's a type of pigeon, but you you know we eat them and stuff. And they they were coming in to to drink, but it, they they fly really sort of 
funny, quick, and it was twilight. It was sort of the sunlight was going down. There was the trees, there was bats, you know, it, it was quick shooting. You couldn't, you couldn't really sort of, uh, you know, aim and shoot. It was, it was like almost like trap shooting, like bam, you know, to like, and between the two of us, I mean, we ran out of ammo, you know, and just to tell you, me and my dad going duck hunting or whatever it was, and then we ended up in this place, just between the two of us hunting, we had 300 rounds, you know, <laughs> that was just day out for us. So it's not like I didn't know how to handle a shotgun at 16, you know, but, uh, you know, he was a careful man and he stuck by his rules and uh, it definitely paid off and absolutely nothing wrong with what, you know, what he did. And uh, I just remember the funny thing that I asked him, like when, cause when we left, you know, okay, we have the shotgun, we have the stuff, we have the jackets, uh, and uh, you know, for the ammo, and I, I said, but, but grandpa, did, did you, you know, where's the car? Did you forget the cartridges? There's no cartridges. He said, no, no, I, I've got the car, I've got the ammo. I said, but where is it? I'm not carrying anything for it. And in his in his jacket, you know, this hunter's jacket, you've got like he had like five uh, shell holders here, and two of them were filled. He said, hey, there's, there's my ammo. You know, I've got two shots. <laughs> and I was like, what? But we're going hunting for what? Pheasants or partridge? You've only got two shells. And he looked at me, he goes, hey, if we see something, I'm only going to need one. <laughs> and, and he wasn't boasting. He wasn't boasting. He came first in all the clay pigeon shooting competitions of the seniors when he was 10 years old or 15 years older than everybody else in the competition. I mean, that man could shoot. And, you know, my dad can shoot but uh, when my grandfather came to visit us out in Africa he also did some shooting you know we went hunting we took him to see buffaloes and you know it was beautiful because he saw everything he took pictures of buffaloes like 10 meters away it's like they stopped to pose lions came into the camp and they you know we had to stay locked in the car the kids and the, the, the adults were like in this little hut with the lions like chewing up the food of the of the campsite because they came early in the morning and so on and so he really enjoyed it but, you know, going out shooting in the bush as we went on this long trip, you know, my dad looked at his father shoot and he walked back to me and he goes, shit, the old man still shoots better than me. <laughs> and you must understand, I think my father, I, I would love to know how many thousands of rounds that man has fired with rifles, shotguns, handguns. I honestly believe it might be, you know, it, it's it's a lot. It's it's hundreds of thousands of rounds. It's not tens of thousands. I believe it's hundreds of thousands. I'm, I'm going to try and do a bit of a calculation on it to see if it could possibly hit a million. But he's, I mean, that man has lived, breathed firearms his entire life. And yet his father shot better than him, but his father had a temperament that um, I'm hoping my son will have, and he seems to have early indications that he might have it. You know, my grandfather was cold, you know, people call him cold, and you know, his own daughter said he was selfish and a fucking idiot woman. Doesn't understand, that man wasn't selfish at all. He was a man, and he wasn't cold either. He was, he used his reason and his father died when he was 19. You know, a very interesting man, my grandfather. Um, uh, I think I'm going to show you a picture of him, which I... Oh, yeah, just give me a second. There you go. That's my grandfather. And the light there from the window is a bit rough, but... That's one of his dogs, he had setters, he likes them. And there you can see in the mountains in the snow, the shotguns are put together with the, um, I think it's partridges or, or it, might, it might even, yeah, it's, I think it's partridges or something, I don't know. But anyway, you can see he's, uh, he was also a champion swimmer for Italy, as was my grandmother. So, uh, hell of a man. Oh uh, yeah. Anyway, I sort of went off piste a little bit, but truth is important. 
and paradoxical thinking is important. So that's my hour for this Sunday. And have a good rest of the day, week, month, life. And I'll see you next time.